No one wants to live in a neighborhood where they fear going out because there's so much crime. You could have said that was the case in certain areas of New York City back in the day, and then sometime in the 1990s the crime rate started to drop police might resort to harsh tactics, such as intensive patrolling of the streets. Judges might hand down rather long sentences for not-so-serious crimes. The streets are safer, but not everyone thinks crackdowns are the best way to reduce crime. This is a definition of a crackdown. Sudden and dramatic increases in police officer presence, sanctions, and threats of apprehension, either for specific offenses or for all offenses in specific places. As we said, crime can be reduced by oppressive policing, but who on earth wants to live in a place where they can only only feel safe if people in uniforms are everywhere. This kind of dystopian reality suits no one. If you need to live behind high walls with huge locks on your doors, life isn't all that wonderful. Experts on crime know this, and so emphasis for some people for a long time has been on trying to make people want to be better citizens rather than oppressing them or scaring them. A result of this is the theory that we're going to discuss today. The concept is pretty simple. If you value the neighborhood where you live, you'll be a better citizen and you'll treat the place with respect. On the other hand, if you live in a hellhole that looks like a hellhole, you might well act like the person that lives in a hellhole. In 1982, two guys called James Q. Wilson and George L. Kelling wrote a story for the Atlantic Monthly called Broken Windows. This is part of what they said. Consider a building with a few broken windows. If the windows are not repaired, the tendency is for vandals to break a few more windows. Eventually, they may even break into the building, and if it's unoccupied, perhaps become squatters or light fires inside. Or consider a pavement. Some litter accumulates. Soon, more accumulates. Eventually, people even start leaving bags of refuse from takeout restaurants there, or even break into cars. The experts tell us that when humans enter an environment, they look for signals as to how they might act in that environment. We're sure you've done this at some point. You visit someone's messy house and you might just make a mess yourself. Why not? They did. You go to a school where the toilets are broken and there's graffiti everywhere, and perhaps some part of you thinks that you don't have to study very hard. Because no one gives a heck at this school. And so in parts of the USA, the broken windows theory was adopted. That meant police taking the riffraff off the streets, but it also meant keeping the streets clean, and it meant no broken windows. This is sometimes called informal social control. Some people have argued that by policing the streets so much that no one dares step out of line can be oppressive, but others argue that having beat cops who communicate with the locals can only be a good thing. Let's now see if it worked. As we said, this kind of policing was first adopted in New York City, but later broken windows policing went on to Boston and then LA. In New York, police got tough on graffiti, while the city tried to get rid of old graffiti. Hanging out on the streets and drinking became a big no-no, as did public urination cleaning car windows for just a few cents, and all manner of street activity not deemed appropriate. In all, police just tried to make the city look better on the outside, and as you know, the intention was to make people behave better. Take away petty crimes, ugly things that are visible on the streets, and the result should be that serious crimes would also happen less. And that happened. New York City did experience a reduction in serious crimes since the broken windows theory was adopted. We must say here that there are advocates of this kind of policing, and there are those that are against it, because they say it means too much surveillance, too many frisks, and too many people getting arrested for very petty crimes. As the writers of Broken Windows Theory said, police would not be tasked just to rid the streets of violent people, but also not violent people nor necessarily criminals, but disreputable or obstreperous or unpredictable people. Some say this was the way to go, while others say it's too oppressive and targets the poor. Let's see what The New Yorker has to say about this theory. It writes, Broken Windows is one of the most cited articles in the history of criminology. It's sometimes called the Bible of policing, but it also makes a strong point in that the writer says Broken Windows has always focused way too much on cleaning up the streets of riffraff rather than doing what it was originally mainly intended to do. That was clean up the city of actual broken windows. It should have meant investing in more housing, fixing places up, doing something about all those abandoned buildings. The New Yorker argues that this didn't happen enough. It cites people who said stop and frisk may work, but cleaning up buildings would work better. Nonetheless, it's hard to argue that the broken windows policing the cops did adopt didn't work. The proof is in the statistics. But then you could ask if the crime rate dropped for other reasons. 
Another source writes that all over the USA in the 1990s, the crime rate was dropping, on average by about 26%, but in New York there was a reduction of 56%, and indeed, many attribute this to Mayor Rudolph Giuliani getting tough on small crimes and embracing the broken windows theory. He once said this, obviously murder and graffiti are two vastly different crimes, but they are still part of the same continuum, and a climate that tolerates one is more likely to tolerate the other. Still, there are skeptics that say that New York City was just part of the trend of crime reduction in the USA, something partly attributed to a decline in unemployment. In one paper, experts argue that this can't be the reason entirely as the crime dropped by so much. Surely, broken windows did have a positive effect, says that paper. In it, the author wrote, between 1990 and 1999, homicide dropped 73%, burglary 66%, assault 40%, robbery 67%, and vehicle heists 73%. Still, you can find other academic papers out there that say there has never been any significant proof that it was broken windows policing that did the trick. Critics also argue that such policing hurt poor people and picked on minorities. Let's now look at Boston. Did it work there? In Boston, it was a man called William J. Bratton who pushed the theory. He too cracked down on petty crimes. One person wrote, Bratton switched police thinking in New York when he was there from waiting until a crime happens and responding to preventing it from happening in the first place. But did serious crime go down? Statistics are available online that show Boston's crime rate from the 60s right up to the present year. Indeed, if you look at those stats, you'll find that sometime in the mid-90s serious crimes in the city started going down. Nonetheless, just like in New York, there are many critics that say broken windows wasn't all it was cracked up to be. You can take that sentence as a double play on words. In 2015, the Boston Globe wrote that we already know the broken windows theory posits that low-level crimes such as graffiti, panhandling, or littering create an atmosphere of lawlessness in a neighborhood, encouraging more serious crimes. The article then states that broken windows might not have actually been the reason for Boston's big drop in crime. It cites the Boston Area Research Initiative, which tells us that the reason crime dropped was more because of people having fewer conflicts, rather than the outside cues that are encouraging criminals into the neighborhoods, the finding suggests another potential interpretation, the notion of private conflict bubbling up and leading up to social disorder, said the researchers. That paper argued that during the 90s, people just began to have a better standard of living, and so there were fewer disputes that led to less crime. They said that it wasn't about nabbing people for misdemeanors or cleaning up parks, but just a consequence of Boston being a better place to live in general. There was more harmony in households, there was more money and more jobs, and this resulted in folks behaving better. The Boston Review is skeptical too, arguing that while broken windows may have worked somewhat, the price of extra policing was too heavy on some people. It writes what broken windows contributed to the overall falling crime rate remains unclear. But what is absolutely clear is that whatever casualty did or did not exist, the cost borne by the communities of color and the poor was too high. It's exactly the same story in Los Angeles. Advocates say more community policing and better looking streets has helped reduce the crime rate. But critics say broken windows policing is just too oppressive toward minorities and the poor. Crime did indeed drop in LA, but again, critics say it was due to a better economy, less unemployment, the crack epidemic not being so bad. One law professor put it as simple as this, when something goes up a lot, it tends to go down a lot. He also said that while he believes there's no certain proof that it was the theory that brought down the crime rate, making streets look more orderly is never a bad thing. He told NPR, strangers have to feel comfortable moving through communities for those communities to thrive. Order is an end in itself, and it doesn't need the justification of serious crime. He also said something you're probably thinking, in that broken windows actually turned into merely stop and frisk. While taking the riffraff off the streets was always part of the theory, it should have also been about buildings, i.e. broken windows. He called the theory seductive, too easy to believe, simplified, and reductive, saying it's time to put the genie back in the bottle and look deeper into why the crime rate dropped in these places in the mid-90s. Others tell us that crime might indeed happen in bad-looking places, but it doesn't necessarily mean one causes the other. Perhaps poverty is the major reason why crime happens. This is a debate that rages on. What we'd like to ask you is this. Why do you think the crime rate fell? Tell us in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other show, Why Your Money Isn't Safe in Your Bank Account. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.